Thank you so much. Um, yes, as was just mentioned, my name is Elise Jensen, and I'm here with my colleague Lama Hasun Ayub, and we are from the Center for Court Innovation, which is in New York City. We are part of the evaluation team for the Defending Childhood Initiative, and um, we're here to talk about the Defending Childhood Demonstration Program, specifically focusing on the tribal sites. A few weeks ago, I believe there was a webinar on the entire um, evaluation of the demonstration program. Uh, some of you might have attended that um, if you have, um, or if you haven't, uh, as was mentioned earlier, there's a link to the webinar on the page. Um, and, and so you can uh, follow that if you didn't get a chance to see it. Um, anyway, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of the overall um, information about the evaluation since we're specifically focusing on the tribal sites today. Um, and you can go back and, and watch the webinar if you weren't there for the other one. But please, if you have any questions, we are going to reserve some time um, in the middle of the presentation and definitely at the end, too. Okay, um, just a quick overview. There were eight defending childhood sites, um, but only six, six of them were part of the evaluation. Those are the ones that are in red, and the blue pins are the ones who are not part of the evaluation, the two Portlands, Portland, Maine, and um, Portland or Multnomah County in Oregon. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the Rocky Boy Reservation in Montana and the Rosebud um, Sioux Indian Reservation in South Dakota. So there were three goals of the Defending Childhood Initiative. The first was to prevent children's exposure to violence. Second was to mitigate the negative impact of such exposure when it does occur. And the third to develop knowledge and spread awareness about children's exposure to violence. As part of the evaluation, we did uh, two main things. A process evaluation, which was um, an extensive um, review or, well, uh, sorry, uh, our phone's ringing in the background. Um, many apologies for that. Anyway, the process evaluation involved three big things. Uh, the one was site visits and interviews at those site visits. Um, we did two rounds over a period of two years, going to all six sites. Um, and actually, in some cases, we did three site visits. One was a bit earlier um, in the process evaluation. Um, as I said, in those site visits, we did many interviews with all sorts of stakeholders and people involved with the Defending Childhood Initiative, kind of getting a sense of what's going on, what are the challenges and successes of the program. Uh, then we did a massive document review where they sent us many things uh, related to what they were doing, whether that was brochures or flyers. Um, also looking at um, other meeting agendas and things of that nature to get a better sense of all the things that were going on. And then we collected uh, these quarterly implementation reports that had a series of things that we were looking at in regards to um, professional trainings, community awareness events, uh, materials related to community awareness, such as brochures and flyers and things of that nature. Um, also collaborative body meetings and how many people were receiving direct services, like mental health services. And so we're kind of keeping track, getting numbers of, of all the things that were going on there. Um, then we did a massive outcome evaluation, which involved a community survey um, that was through the phone. Um, the only site that didn't get that was um, Memphis, but uh, um, we did it to, with the other five sites and um, called people and, and asked them about their awareness regarding children's exposure to violence and their definitions, what they thought was children's exposure to violence, and um, kind of getting a sense also of the prevalence of children's exposure to violence. Then we did a professional practices survey, um, which looked at um, things that were learned in the professional trainings that were given across the sites and measuring whether there was any improvement there and, um, and what they learned. And also looking at core community level indicators, and that was um, violence in the home, violence in schools, and violence in the community, and seeing whether those indicators changed throughout the course of the initiative. Um, Okay, within each uh, site, there were strategies that they used to address children's exposure to violence, and we kind of grouped them into six categories. That was prevention, case management, treatment and healing, community awareness and education, professional training, and system and infrastructure change. And so we're going to 
the next few slides are going to go over each of those strategies for the tribal sites specifically. All right, so the first was prevention. And for the tribal sites, culture was really a big thing in general. It was kind of infused into everything that they did. Um, for example, at the Rosebud Reservation site, they had a phrase called Matakeo Asen. I hope I pronounced that right. And it means all things are related. And they referred to everyone as re relatives rather than clients. And um, that meant you know, they will be there for them at all times because they are their relatives. And anyway, so culture was really infused into um, their prevention programming and their activities incorporated traditional Lakota and Chippewa Cree culture um, as a means of prevention. At Rocky Boy specifically, they did smudging, drumming, traditional arts and crafts, and had these youth summer camps where they learned a lot of things uh, related to their culture. And at Rosebud, they also did smudging and made traditional foods uh, during events and, and learned about jewelry making as well as um, community garden, making community gardens. And there they would talk about issues related to healthy relationships and maybe bullying and so learn more about what violence means um, while doing these cultural activities. Um, also, they had a naming ceremony that was very important um, where they would receive a Lakota name and um, they would then feel um, it was there to make them more connected to their cultures because they felt that the youth were not as connected anymore and, and this culture was seen as a protective factor. Um, also at Rosebud they had a newsletter with a section on Lakota vocabulary words um, so they could begin to learn the language more because as I said before they felt like the youth weren't connected with their culture and this would be a good thing to, um, to help them uh, with, you know, issues that they might be dealing with or, or um, yeah. Okay, and also there's prevention programming in the schools. At Rocky Boy, they implemented uh, programming related to domestic violence and bullying. Specifically, they have this Hope or Delta group where students who've experienced violence and trauma, you know, met together and talked about things. Also, there was a, a BFF curriculum for girls and dealing with bullying and healthy relationships. and. Um, and then also the Rocky Boy um, Children's Exposure to Violence program did a healthy lifestyles program where they learned more about just um, how to maintain a healthy lifestyle and healthy relationships and dealing with things related to exposure to violence in general. Um, some of the challenges at both sites was keeping the students engaged and the parents involved. Um, also ensuring that programming is interesting and relevant to youth. Um, they also had a challenge with working with youth living in poverty or households that already have violence or alcohol abuse. And then there was really limited evidence-based pro prevention programs geared to tribal youth um, that discuss historical trauma. Um, oh, and I wanted to go back and say also getting into schools was a big challenge, not so much for Rocky Boy because uh, the superintendent was very involved at their collaborative body meetings, but um, generally it was, it was difficult to do prevention programming within the schools. Um, so case management was a big component, or case management and advocacy was a big component at both tribal sites, more so there than any of the other sites uh, for, the de for the Defending Childhood program. Um, specifically in Rocky Boy, they had a domestic violence slash sexual assault and child advocacy model. Um, they had domestic violence advocates that dealt with uh, safety planning, intake and referral, short-term and emergency housing assistance, court and law enforcement accompaniment, and support groups. Um, so really, they did a lot of crisis advocacy where they had responded to an immediate crisis and they might get a referral from law enforcement and so they would be out there on the scene to help. Um, if there was a situation where uh, someone was exposed to violence. Um, they also had child advocates uh, where they would spend time with children and remain with them throughout. Uh, maybe they, if they had an abuse or neglect case, uh, take him or her to the hospital or to doctor's appointments, um, to court if necessary, um, playing the advocacy role, as I said, in court proceedings and other formal events. And for them, referrals came from agencies, uh, law enforcement, 
um, from the victims themselves or from community members if they interacted with them at some event and the member came up to them. Um, right, and the advocates never really formally closed any of the cases or ended relationships with the clients. They always had an ongoing relationship with them and, and maintain and make sure everything was still okay. So they spent quite a lot of time with um, with the people that they spent time with, with the youth and adults. In Rosebud, uh, they had the Rosebud Care Advocacy Model, uh, where they worked with young people to create individualized action plans as far as what services they might need. They helped make referrals to local service providers to maybe counseling services um, or culturally based mental health um, services, also alcohol treatment, and they did a lot with equine therapy or, or horses. Um, horses are very important in their culture and, and seen as very therapeutic, and so some of the children received therapy that way if they had been um, traumatized in some way. Um, referrals came from families or guardians, um, prevention and outreach staff who came into contact with victims, perhaps um, relatives at uh, community meetings, um, things of that nature. And um, the advocates would also do civil legal advocacy and court accompaniment like they did at the Rocky Boy. And also they prepared paperwork for protection orders and accompanied children to a protection order hearing. And uh, there were advocates within the school system to ensure that educational needs of the youth are met. Uh, challenges in regards to case management and advocacy include staff burnout. That was definitely a big one because they work so much uh, with the children and they're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so um, that was an issue that came up a lot in our interviews. Uh, lack of transportation and the size of the reservation, another big issue, um, especially in the winter. Both of these areas were um, yeah, the climate was not so suitable to traveling for most of the year, and so uh, that posed many challenges to getting to the, someone services or, yeah, um, helping them out, and and then oftentimes a lot of people didn't have transportation too, and so um, they couldn't even go anywhere if they wanted to. Um, also, families on the reservation have basic needs such as lack they lack food and shelter and clothing that need to be taken care of first. Um, even before addressing um, the effects that they had been exposed to violence in some way. And so that, that was a huge thing, too. They felt like they were doing a lot of. Um, and then there was a big lack of information sharing across agencies, not so much in Rocky Boy. I think they had a better relationship with law enforcement and, and other agencies, but definitely in, in Rosebud, um, the juvenile courts uh, were not friendly with the um, the Rosebud advocates, as well as law enforcement. Um, uh, There's just a lot of uh, um, animosity there, or yeah, it, it just wasn't a good situation for sharing information. Okay, uh, treatment and healing. Um, wasn't so much um, like some of the other sites in the demonstration programs um, who had formal um, evidence-based practices to do treatment, um, but um, on the reservation, Rocky Boy staff was trained on the medicine wheel model, um, and also Rosebud had Lakota mental health training. Um, some of their other practices in regards to healing um, that involved culture were using sweat lodges um, and other spiritual practices. And as I mentioned earlier, there's equine therapy that was a big part. Um, both Rosebud and Rocky Boy did some too. Um, we're using the horses as a form of therapy for children who've been traumatized, and they seem to have a lot of success with that. Uh, the kids really enjoyed it. And um, they also collaborated with local substance abuse providers, mental health services, and other training treatment agencies when they could, but those um, places had limited um, availability, so that was kind of a challenge with that, getting people the services that they need. Um, in regards to community awareness and education, um, Rocky Boy developed and distributed items such as t-shirts, backpacks, bumper stickers, water bottles with the project's logo. Um, they had many family, family fun nights and cultural fairs. Um, they also hosted community summits for 
practitioners uh, where they could learn about various topics related to children's exposure to violence. They had um, organized awareness walks um, and created and distributed brochures and information cards varying in topic and design um, to be distributed at like the family fun nights or the community summits. Um, Rosebud also did do some paraphernalia, but mainly they made uh, presentations about the project in schools and in the different communities on the reservation. Um, they hosted a weekly radio show to discuss relevant topics, which was very popular. Um, and also I mentioned earlier a bit about the jewelry making and creating a community garden. Uh, that was one of the more um, recent developments in their uh, project. They had gone out to some of the parts of the reservation that hadn't been um, accessed so much in regards to community awareness and, and the, the people were very responsive to those things um, because they were um, getting back to cultural things as well as a chance to raise awareness about uh, issues related to children's exposure violence. And um, some of the challenges were that members of the community do not want to talk about children's exposure to violence because it's kind of a taboo topic and so um, that would be hard to do as well as there is this um, fear of retaliation if relatives are implicated in reports of violence. So let me explain that a little bit better. Um, so the staff talked about the definition of violence and how to identify it and where to report it in some of these community awareness events. And some community members were worried about reporting and implicating other community members. And given the small size of the reservation and how everyone knows everybody, and so that's kind of where the sphere of retaliation comes from. Okay. And, um, I mentioned uh, briefly in the outcome evaluation, we did a um, community survey where we looked at community attitudes in regards to children's exposure to violence. And one of the things we also wanted to know is if people knew about the Defending Childhood Initiative. And in both of our tribal sites, uh, we had a huge increase from those at baseline who said they had heard of the Defending Childhood Initiative um, to those at follow-up. And so in the at baseline, there was 25%, so they had heard of the Defending Child Initiative then, 50% uh, in the end. So that, that's really great. It was statistically significant, and it shows that the community awareness things that they were doing at both tribal sites really had an impact as far as you know, knowing that Defending Childhood was out there, um, and they were contacting the, the advocates. And um, yeah, it seemed to be like a, a really a great thing for them. Um, also, there were generally high levels of understanding of what violence is and high willingness to report. So over 75% of tribal community members believe that yelling at someone is a violent behavior. They also, um, or over 95% believe that treating, sorry, threatening to hurt someone is violent behavior. And over 90% believe that sexual harassment is a form of violence. Um, also, over 90% believe that children's exposure to violence can lead to psychological problems. And almost 80% believe that being exposed to violence in childhood leads to um, health problems. So those were just a few quick findings from our community survey related to the tribal sites. Um, OK, professional training um, was something that the tribal sites did. Um, and that consisted of a, a community summit at the Rocky Boy Reservation. Um, they were trained professionals and service providers as well as provided education to community members at these large community summits. And so some of the topics included the ACEs study, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences study, um, as well as talking about juvenile probation processes, victim witness advocacy, cultural views on su suicide, and um, also there was local and national training for uh, DCI staff and partners such as the Lakota Mental Health Training and Montana Native Women's Coalition Tribal Listening Session uh, for Rosebud. And I see I'm running out of time here. Um, also, uh, system infrastructure and capacity building that was really at Rosebud. They revised their tribal legislation and policy. Um, making amendments to the Child Protection Code, uh, specifically looking at the definition of um, 
reasonable force used by a parent, guardian, or teacher, or in that reasonable force included violence, and so um, they wanted to change that and take out violence as reasonable um, force, as well as they looked into changing the definition of abuse, and um, we're working towards that towards the end of the evaluation. Okay. So um, this is Lama. Before we move on to lessons learned, we thought we might take one or two questions about everything you just heard. It's a lot of information. So if we have a couple questions, either through the chat or on the phone, um, we can take them now. Otherwise, we can we can wait till the end as well. Do we? Do we have any? Hi, Lama. It's Michelle. It doesn't appear that we um, have any questions right now. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to lessons learned. Um, so Elise gave you um, sort of an overview of what the two tribal sites did for the Defending Childhood Initiative, and I'm going to dive into what we believe the lessons learned are. Um, I should say that, you know, obviously all of these lessons learned, and I'm also going to talk about recommendations, um, were developed um, through our observations and in our interviews, but also in collaboration with the tribal sites, the staff there, the TA providers for this study, which included um, a native TA provider called Native Streams, um, who provided us with a lot of great feedback. Um, and so that's just I just want you to know that before we before we dive into it. So um, our first lesson learned is about historical trauma and sort of just keeping that in mind during the implementation and evaluation and technical assistance. Every really component of implementing one of these initiatives, um, as we all know, you know, for for many many years. Since the inception of this country, federal policies disrupted the lives of Native communities, whether it's by, uh, through, you know, and we document this a lot in our reports, but I, whether it's through attempts to destroy their culture, language, um, livelihoods, um, and so it's, that, it's just very important to be cognizant of that and to make sure it's, a, a sort of the acknowledgement of it is included in your conversations around um, working with tribal communities. And a lot of tribal uh, communities see their traditional culture and values as protective factor. I mean, one of the quotes we have in our report from, from the Rocky Boy Reservation is that culture is prevention. And, and, and that was told to us by many of the staff members there that they, that they believe that by returning to their traditional values um, that they can they can prevent violence, they can help reduce children's exposure to violence, um, and they can also help treat it. And so um, it, it's an important consideration. Did you call? It's an important consideration for them, and, and it should be in, in when we think about these efforts. Um, another important lesson learned is about tribal politics. And I just want to put this in context. If, if any of you were in, at our other webinar where we talked about all of the defending childhood sites, every site has political issues. I mean, it, it, you know, there's there needs to be political will for things to be um, accomplished, whether that's in a tribal site or whether it's in the city of Boston. And there needs to be, uh, and if there are political barriers, it can it can create challenges. And so, um, you know, tribal communities um, have you know similar politics to a lot of other places, but they do have their own special considerations as well. Um, grants can uh, may be seen as job creators whenever grants come in um, because of the high em unemployment um, that exists um, in tribal territory. The the grant funded positions might become political, um, and this this could also happen anywhere else. But it's it's an issue in, in, that we observed in tribal communities. There is a high turnover and lack of job security, and that affects the sustainability of the initiative. And so if um, if people move in and out a lot, and um, the project coordinator changes often, or the person you, you who, who's the sort of the who oversees the project changes often, it, it can create challenges in terms of like just implementing this the, the initiative, but also sustaining it for the long term. 
Um, and it, it can also create low morale among staff when there's a lot of turnover. You know, and tribal communities are all different, so I mean, this is just something to keep in mind no matter what we talk about, that even in the same state, different tribes are different, and so, you know, the issues that emerge in one might not emerge in another. For if in, in our case, you know, there were less tribal political issues at Rocky Boy than Rosebud, but this is, it's also true literally of almost everything that they do. They're, they're just very different communities and different people. Um, so rural or frontier areas, um, you know, a lot of reservations, or at least the reservations that we went to, um, are, you know, they're basically frontier. They're they're even beyond rural. They um, there's there's not any major urban center nearby, and they just being in a rural area has unique opportunities, but also challenges. It's hard. It can be hard to reach people to raise awareness. If an initi initiative is implemented, people need to know about it to access. What, whatever services it provides. And so access to services can be more challenging. And even collaboration can be challenging. Elise talked a little bit about the winter months and how difficult it is to travel across um, Montana or <laughs> the entire state, really. So during that time, and so that can also uh, affect collaboration. It's really important for um, rural sites in general, whether they're tribal or non-tribal, to have you know, more intensive TA that is really focused on their needs and, and initiatives that attempt to address children's exposure to violence or, um, or trauma amongst children really need to keep in mind the unique challenges associated with rural areas. You know, a few other challenges that we observed, and these, you know, were common across all the sites, but we thought um, we could highlight them for you all is, you know, collaborative fatigue and keeping partners engaged, especially on reservations where um, it, where the communities are smaller and it feels like it's the same people going to the same meetings across, you know, four different initiatives. So just a, a good example is at Rocky Boy, they had the Defending Childhood Collaborative Body, but they also had a wellness coalition and it was basically, give or take a few people, it was basically the same, you know, 10 people or so that went to both meetings. And so that creates fatigue and, and people become less engaged over time or they think, oh, I'll see you at this other meeting so I don't need to go to your Defending Childhood meeting. And I think that's just important to keep in mind. And I, it, the other thing about collaborative fatigue is that over time as initiatives sort of um, unfold and implementation kicks in and there's less planning, um, it's really hard to keep people engaged, um, especially if their agency is not the one that was selected, for example, to do treatment. Um, and what I just said also um, goes to the second bullet about overlapping initiatives and effort. There's a lot of things that might be going on at a reservation, a lot of different funding sources, whether it's through the federal government, the Indian Health Service, all these different um, agencies that are, uh, that, are, that are doing things sort of in the same general area, and so it can become a challenge. Um, and then another challenge, uh, again, at the tribal and non-tribal sites, but this is particularly uh, relevant to the tribal sites, is funders really push the use of evidence-based practices, um, which, which you know, in general is very important, but a lot of sites struggle with incorporating them, especially if they want to try out novel or innovative ideas that don't necessarily have the evidence base there. And most of the evidence, the evidence that we're talking about, really does not include tribal communities in the research. And so how evidence-based is it if you are trying to implement it in, in a community where it's never been implemented before? Even some of the most well-researched treatments like TFCBT, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, it, um, it, they, they've only just started doing research on tribal communities with it, and so it's it, um, for, for tribal communities it's considered a promising practice and doesn't have really the, the solid evidence base as it, do, as it does with non-tribal communities. Um, and some traditional tribal practices that we mentioned, like sweat lodges, are considered community validated. The community believes that they're effective and that um, is often enough for them to be um, implemented. So I'm going to um, head into our recommendations. So we developed um, recommendations for, our report has you know, something like 60 recommendations, um, and we broke them up into categories, recommendations for other jurisdictions, for other tribal communities, for funders, for TA providers, and for researchers. And we're really going to focus on a few of the recommendations for other jurisdictions and the recommendations for tribal communities in terms of implementing large-scale initiatives um, of any kind, but also to address children's exposure to violence. 
So um, the first recommendation I'm going to talk about is focusing on the positive. It's really easy to just um, focus on the negative, whether it's through prevention or treatment, and, um, and, and not sending enough positive messages. So in addition to um, talking to people about the, the prevalence of children's exposure to violence or the prevalence of trauma, we should also be talking to them about um, you know what a healthy relationship looks like. What a healthy community looks like. What do we what do we envision for our community? And that's actually um, really intertwined with the tribal approach to um, uh, culture as prevention, um, because they do focus on the positive in that sense. Our second recommendation is to beware of mission creep. This is a really challenging one. We talked about it extensively in our other webinar. Um, and by this we mean, you know, when an initiative's goal is to reduce children's exposure to violence or prevent children's exposure to violence, then you're working with uh, disadvantaged communities and people who really have concentrated disadvantage in their lives. It's really hard to focus on that um, when you know that you need to address things like poverty and um, housing and unemployment. And it's really easy to sort of go to start addressing all those things and move away from addressing the central issue that the initiative is for, which is children's exposure to violence. And so I don't know that there's a clear answer to that um, or to how not to do that, but I think it's just something that everyone needs to be cognizant of. Um, another one of our recommendations is to try to offer home-based services to overcome transportation obstacles, especially in rural areas and in the winter when it's hard for people to get to places um, or to get to a central location to get services. Offering home-based services can, is one way that um, some of those challenges can be alleviated. Um, in terms of preparing for unintended consequences, um, here we're really talking about the, you know, when, you know, th there's a lot of ways to, to interpret this, but um, one of them is simply that, you know, when we increase awareness about children's exposure to violence, we're going to have increased reporting about children's exposure to violence, and we need to make sure that the agencies that are being, rep uh, that are getting the reports and the the staff that are, that are going to address these issues or provide treatment and healing are prepared um, for those consequences. And focusing on systems change is really just about um, the fact that when you are able to change processes or protocols or the way agencies handle things, um, it's more sustainable than trying to do uh, one-shot, um, you know, band-aid treatments for a problem. Some of our recommendations for tribal communities, um, I'm going to highlight here. They re these so these recommendations really came from our tribal uh, sites. They um, when we asked them, you know, what is your recommendation for other tribes who might be trying to implement this, or do this type of work, implement a large scale initiative, try to address a really difficult topic like children's exposure to violence. And the first recommendation they gave us was to have faith and to, to have faith that what you do will help people, even if it's a challenging topic area or if the community has a, uh, you know, it, it's a taboo topic that, no, that few people want to talk about. Um, it's really important to just keep in mind that hopefully your efforts will, will help people. Adopt a strength-based approach is really similar to um, focusing on the positive. Um, and this is really about not looking at the deficits and trying to focus on the strengths of the situation and work together um, through your collaborative body by including other people, by including um, tribal elders or peacemakers to focus on the strengths and find solutions to problems that are that are um, that are positive. Work together and take care of each other. Um, this is this is more this is also about collaboration, but it's also about self and community care, especially for the front line line staff, like either the advocate staff or sometimes the treatment staff who are working directly with victims. It's really important that these staff um, have the opportunities to debrief, have the opportunities to, to get counseling themselves if they need it. Many of um, the people who are working on the front lines um, in tribal communities are dealing with some of the, with similar problems to, to the to the victims they're working with. And so that's really important to keep in mind and and it's important to take care of each other. And then streamlining processes is our last recommendation for tribal sites. This is really about um, the, you know, trying to address some of the issues around having political will and having um, 
transparency and if processes are streamlined with funding and hiring that can help ensure sustainability and less turnover of staff um, and if you have an advisory board or a decision making board that's permanent for the length of the grant and includes key tribal members who are respected and unlikely to change that can help remove some of the um, variance that results from um, relying so, so only on like a tri the tribal council or people who might be in political positions that are likely to change or senior staff people who might have uh, turnover in their positions. So some other important considerations and these are really pulled from our um, and this, I think this is the last thing I'll say, are really pulled from our recommendations. You know, I think it's a good idea to work with native TA providers and consultants. They're out there. Um, you can, you know, if, the, if there's no TA provider for your initiative right now, you can, you can find them and bring them in as consultants. Our research team, even in our evaluation, had tribal consultants. Um, and so the tribal consultants, um, even for tribal territories, are really good at helping bridge, you know, the local experience with sort of the national dialogue or the national um, initiative. Um, and we, we also encourage frequent site visits and we encourage tribal communities themselves to be open to the idea of site visits um, and, and to have people come in and learn about what they're doing. Um, we encourage research partners to incorporate non-Western research practice. We wish we could have done more of this. Um, tribal communities can also bring in local evaluators that they trust if they have existing relationships and those local evaluators can partner with national evaluators. Um, you, we, it's important to understand that the spending processes may be more complex for tribal sites and some of the things that that might take a month in a non-tribal site take longer in a tribal site and that's just, you know, you can read more about that in our report. And then I think ask the national research team to give back. Um, you know, tribal sites can ask those researchers to help them with things like designing local evaluations. Our tribal sites added questions to our data collection tools that they were interested in. All our sites did actually. Um, but we, we sort of opened up the instruments to them and said, is there anything you'd like to know or any questions that you'd like to ask that we can include in our community survey um, that would be helpful to you. Um, researchers, the national research team can present key evaluation findings or provide them access with the data if they want to do their own analyses. Um, so for more information, and we're going to take questions right after this, but I just want to put up this link. Um, you can read our cross-site report, which sort of tries to synthesize our findings across sites. But we also have two tribal-specific reports. We have one on the Rosebud Sioux Tribes Defending Childhood Initiative, and the second one is on Rock, Rock, um, what they call Rock and Boys Children Exposed to Violence Project. Those reports individually do it, do it are much more, much more detailed than anything we've talked about here uh, in terms of describing the programs, but also um, in terms of describing the challenges um, the sites had. The other thing you'll find that's not up here on this, but on the same web page is our um, soon to be released outcome evaluation report. In a few weeks, um, we'll have that up there as well, hopefully. Or maybe a couple months, but soon. <laughs> um, and lastly, I'll just put, Rachel Swanner is our project director, so this is her email if you have any follow-up questions or um, or comments for us, and if you have comment, if you read our reports and have comments, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but right now, I guess we'll take questions either by phone or by chat. So, however, um, whatever works best for you. Hi, Mama and Alyssa. This is Michelle. Um, I do have a question. So, I know that you, in your recommendations, um, said that maybe we should use a national native TA provider, but are there other ways that um, our communities, our, our project um, teams can make inroads with tribal communities uh, in the way of, because we want to do some focus groups. And so are there ways that you recommend that we begin to have these conversations with um, native communities? Um. I think it's challenging. Um, you know, it's, it's tribal communities um, have a lot of, justifiably, a lot of distrust of government, of federal government, national initiatives, and they also have, and this was our personal experience, they have also have distrust of researchers who um, 
who might come in and not have a good understanding of their their context. Um, I would say, you know, um, to reach out to their tribal councils, reach out to their um, political leaders, but also do reach out to some of the service agencies um, on the tribal lands that are serving the tribal people. Um, and try to build relationships. This is a long process. I think that's the best way to think of it, that this it's not going to happen overnight. And um, and the, 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 even though the process is long, hopefully over time, like some trust will be built between you and the and the people you're trying to get in touch with or you're trying to work with. Also, sometimes it helps if you have one um, person of contact that seems to be very helpful, then they'll lead you to other people. That's what I have found in other site, other projects too, with tribe working with tribes. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard to find that one person though. But and maybe even if there's a IRB or internal review board. Um, they might be very helpful. I'm not sure what you might have to go through, but you might have to do something like that if you're doing focus groups. Um, and, and right, then, then just um, right, have that person of contact help you get in touch with other people. And, um, and, and definitely don't hesitate to call. Email is, is usually not so good, too. Um, I, I think that's something I've learned. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think I've learned that calling, nobody and most people we've interacted with don't mind if you cold call them, which is like the polar opposite of um, the East Coast over here. Um, but um, or even just drop by for a visit if you're in the area. But um, but the other thing I was going to say is I, I also think it's important if your plan is to do focus groups, and I don't know what the goal of the focus groups is, but um, I think it's important to just you know not not to go there and say oh we're coming in to do focus groups. Can you um, pull together a group of people, I think you want to bring someone on board. You want someone to lead the charge and to and you want to engage that person or people in developing the focus groups and talk to them about what they might want, what their goals are, um, if there's any way these focus groups can be helpful to them. You, you, you need to be, I would say you need to be really um, inclusive. That's a great yeah. word. Yeah, you need to be really inclusive and, and um, and I think it's important both for the quality of your focus groups and for um, for the tribe themselves in terms of feeling like they have a role and that they're not just being solicited, you know, one time for information that they don't really want to give anyway. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And June Elstead, who is the tribal liaison for our Montana site, has typed a, a comment into the chat. Um, it says, we do have to have IRB approval and all the, re all the reservations. And um, I think she's saying that they are still waiting for Rocky Boy IRB approval. Um, she's typing, so let's give her a second. No, Rocky, Rocky Boy, Rocky Mountain is in addition to all the individual reservations. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that um, we, you know, we face these, uh, this with this study and other studies where, you know, if you're working with multiple tribes, there are probably multiple IRBs that have different concerns, um, that you have to go through, and I think that's just part of the process, and you need to account for the time that that'll take. Um, it can be pretty time consuming. Um. And some IRBs will require you to appear in person um, and things like that. And I think it's just, you know, it's really important to them. It's really important to them to review the research that's going on um, on their people. And I'm sure you understand why. There's been a lot of sort of negative experiences historically with researchers, especially in the biomedical field, 
Um, um, with tribal communities, um, I'm sure you can just Google it and find a lot of sort of horror stories that have happened to them. And so they're they're conscious and they've set up these IRBs um, for the purpose of ensuring that they have reviewed and approved all research that will be conducted um, with their with their communities. So. It's it's another it's another thing you have to do, but I think it's important to just keep in mind why they make us why they make people outside do it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions um, that anyone has about the initiative or some of our recommendations or lessons learned? Aaron is typing. One moment, please. Aaron wants to know, do you have suggestions for the collabora collaboration fatigue? Um, I think this is a, this is another really tough issue. I think you know some of our observations on what has worked is just really being thinking constructively about what your collaborative body is doing, especially once you move into implementation and it's sort of things are just chugging along. People are really involved in the planning stages because you're soliciting ideas and you're trying to figure out your strategic plan, but once um, the project starts uh, being implemented, there's less involvement. And some sites did do a, a good job about having very structured meetings for their uh, collaborative bodies and or sort of bringing them in on an ad hoc basis when you know their specific expertise was needed. Um, I think they cut down the meetings so they might have been monthly and then moved to quarterly. Yeah. Yeah. quarterly. yeah, I mean reducing the number of meetings mm -hmm. over time depending on what's going on is also another way to just ensure that when people do meet that they are that they're more engaged and more interested and want updates on what's been happening. I mean, the thing to you know, there are going to be challenges that emerge even during implementation. Your collaborative body members can help you think through them or address them. And so just making sure that the the meetings um, have specific goals, have specific ways for people to be engaged, um, helps with the collaboration, collaborative body fatigue uh, over time. And this is Michelle. Don't you, don't you find, um, Mama and Elise, that it's okay as the project moves to tell our, um, our teams that sometimes it's okay to retire members or place them on sort of an inactive list and bring new members in as needs for the project change? I think a couple of our sites did do that, but I think it's also important to make sure that uh, simultaneously that um, people's voices are not left out as things move forward. Yeah. Right. And sometimes, it, though, it helped to have some more people because they had historical knowledge of the project. So if there is a way to like transition a new person in with kind of explaining all that's happened prior. <laughs> um, I think that would be good, important. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions before we close out, before we end the webinar? Aaron says thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, you can always email Rachel um, at the email you see uh, in front of you. And there's also uh, links to the old webinar and our, our website. So um, we hope to hear from you. Otherwise, good luck with everything you're doing. And thank you. Thank you so much.